A vote of six to one to one to one was made to accept Dr. Postlewaite's resignation. Six yeses, one no, one abstention, and one absence. A strange vote that many are calling a strange circumstance. Entertain a moment for an adjournment. As quickly as the vote was made, the meeting was over, with many questions still left unanswered. One thing we know for sure is that Dr. Postlewaite will stop serving as superintendent on January 2nd, but will continue to be an employee of the district until June 30th. What she'll be doing in the meantime is unclear. How long have you known about the situation of the possible resignation and then you being selected as the interim? Uh, well, I don't know. I was, I was approached this past Monday and said that was a possibility. And um, so here we are. Another thing we know is that Don Kennedy will serve as interim beginning on January 3rd. Kennedy is chief financial officer for the district. Dr. Postlewaite released this statement on her resignation, saying in part, she's proud of her past seven years with CCSD and wishes the district the best. More questions, though, surrounding her departure, including how much money she might make, are also unclear. The board authorized their chairman, Dr. Reverend Eric Mack, to, quote, execute an agreement with Dr. Postlewaite regarding her resignation. We attempted to ask board members what that meant, but we're told they were unavailable. You know, the board members are everything No, they've all left. Okay. <laughs> all right, thank you. I also texted Dr. Mack personally for an answer and have not gotten a response. Postlewaite's contract was set to expire on June 30th, 2024. Two years to the day she's set to end employment with the district. As of Wednesday, the district still owed her around half a million dollars in salary through the end of that contract. Now, I did end up, end up speaking with one board member in Cindy Coates on the phone. She was the one absence for the vote today. She says she's unclear on what that agreement Dr. Mack might present to Postal Late would be. She's also unsure what role Postal Late will serve in the district until June. Thank you so much, Eli. Well, with the new Omicron variant spreading rapidly, MUSC provided updates today regarding holiday COVID numbers. Our Terriston Clark listened in on that news conference today to find out how much more transmissible this variant is and what mask works best to prevent the spread of COVID. Terriston. Yeah, Natalie, the Omicron variant is extremely contagious. In fact, researchers say it is two and a half times more transmissible than the Delta variant. MUSC doctors and experts gave us tips to help prevent the further spread of COVID. In a single day, DHEC reported close to 3,400 additional cases of COVID. Experts say COVID is spreading rapidly. MUSC is reporting reasonable inpatient numbers. So for the Charleston division, we're in the mid 20s. Obviously, that you know changes by the hour. Um, and across the other divisions, each division has between 20 and 25 inpatients, which is still pretty reasonable. So our capacity is still very good. The Omicron is running rampant. It's doubling to tripling about twice a week. Um, and so every two to three days, we're seeing a doubling of the number of cases um, that have Omicron. So um, for the first week in December, we were at 3%. The second week in December, we went to 11%. And um, for the third week, um, ending in December 20th, uh, we were at 61% uh, cases being Omicron. There's also an uptick in pediatric COVID cases at MUSC. Today, we do have five children uh, in the hospital with COVID, active, uh, active acute COVID. And that, um, we hadn't seen that kind of number since about mid-October. According to experts, N95 masks or double masking help avoid the spread of COVID. They also want to remind people to social distance, avoid large crowds, and wear your mask. All right, where people vote in the state is now another step closer to changing. Today, the SC House of Representatives is going to hold a public hearing to look at new congressional maps. Sean Mahoney is here in the studio right now with this story. So, Sean, this hearing, it's coming with some controversy and accusations of racial bias. Who's making these claims? Yeah, Leah, the ACLU, it filed a lawsuit back in October against the South Carolina House of Representatives new district lines and attorneys claim these new district lines for the congressional districts are the worst the ACU, ACLU has ever seen, saying it's, quote, packing and cracking minority voters. So here's what the maps, this is the new proposed maps with parts of West Ashley, Johns Island and the peninsula now 
pushed into they're currently in District 1, but these new lines would in essence remove all those areas from Representative Nancy Mace's district and put them into Jen Clyburn's district, District 6. And that's why the ACLU's attorneys have a problem with it. They feel it's pushing a majority of the black and minority voters out of their district, which makes District 1 less competitive. They also feel this was done intentionally to black communities. The League of Women Voters say that if these new maps were passed, it would leave District one with only a 16% African American population. In the state house, they have drawn lines which we say uh, discriminate against black voters with the overall effect of giving them too much voice in a very small number of districts and no voice in all the rest, diluting their power overall. So if they pass the worst versions of the proposed maps that they've put forward so far, um, it's a high likelihood that we'll have to go into court again. Now, Trevetti claims these new maps violate the Voting Rights Act and many civil rights of voters. We reached out to Republican representatives such as Nancy Mace and Linda Bennett for a response to these claims, but haven't heard back from them yet. Now, the public hearing is set for 10 a.m. today at the state courthouse. A decision, it won't be made today, but these maps are expected to be voted on by mid-January.